This lecture continues our look at Napoleon Bonaparte. He has just taken power and has established his new government. By 1804, he will declare himself Emperor of France. This lecture will focus on his domestic accomplishments, as well as on his conquest of Europe and his wars, basically his foreign policy. After he became emperor and he had the trust of the French people, it was time to gain more land for the French Empire. We will quickly review some of the major domestic policies to refresh your memory, and then discuss what really made him famous, his military conquests. Napoleon once said, I am the revolution. By that, he meant that he was the culmination of the French Revolution. It was over because he had arrived. He wanted an enlightened government, but had seen what France went through when it was governed by the mob, or the people. So he took matters into his own hands. His right-hand man, Joseph Fouché, was the head of the secret police for Napoleon. There was a network of spies, but not for the same purposes as during the Reign of Terror. This network of spies was to gauge the attitude of the public. Were some people jailed for going against him? Absolutely. Was it as brutal as the Reign of Terror? Definitely not. But Napoleon did believe that he needed to be well informed, and his ne network did just that. One of the first orders of business for Napoleon was to create the National Bank of France and put into play a standardized currency that was on a standard of coinage, not just some floating pieces of paper. This is really what finally stabilized the economy. When was the last time they had a bank? I mean, that was before the bubbles. People actually did end up turning in their bank notes from the crazy times of the French Revolution and in turn received new coinage. Bread prices stabilized and the bank was regulated. French citizens were astounded that the absurdity of the economy had been stabilized by one man. Although it would take many years for the problems to truly be solved, the economy was on the right path again. No wonder the people actually accepted Napoleon. Napoleon also stabilized the religious tensions, as well as restored the calendar. Most French people were Catholics, and the revolution had denied them the right to their religious freedoms. Remember the cult of the supreme being and the de-Christianization movement? Napoleon's reason for restoring the relationship with the Pope and the Catholic Church was mainly to appease the people. He famously had said, religion is excellent stuff for keeping people quiet. He also had alluded to the fact that if he had governed a nation of Jews, he'd have rebuilt the temple. Basically, he just wanted to make the people happy. The document that restored the relationship was called the Concordat of 1801. The Catholic Church wasn't thrilled with the document, though, simply because Napoleon said they could not have the land that they lost to the revolutionaries back. It was still French, and the priests had to remain employees of the French government. So the Pope was not very happy with the arrangements, which is why Napoleon ended up putting him under house arrest. There's not much you can do when the man controls Italy as well as France. Napoleon also put education as a priority. He wanted a system that allowed more people, like himself, to come into positions of government. Thus, he gave education to the people. He founded his Lycee system, which increased the number of schools as well as produced exams for prospective employees of the French government. You had to achieve a certain score on the exam to get a position, or well, at least to even be in contention for a position. In that way, Napoleon knew people weren't just being hired for their title or for their money. Almost anyone could attend the Lycees with his scholarship system that was in place as well, of course, if they had the desire and the ability to go to the school. The Legion of Honor was created in 1802 and is actually still in play today. This is a brilliant plan to keep his enemies, or at least potential enemies, close. Anyone that comes to power through a coup, like Napoleon, is paranoid that someone else is forming a plot against them. Thus, he created a palace for the best and the brightest generals in his army. He gave them a title and allowed them to live at the palace. This way, he kept them close to him and kept them happy and appreciated so that the generals who could potentially become rivals would not become rivals, but would be loyal supporters instead. Not a bad plan. As you probably already know, Napoleon also sold the territory of Louisiana to the United States for a very small sum compared to what the land was probably worth. That's why, of course, we have the famous Lewis and Clark expeditions, which you can see on the map. He sold it because he saw the need for the money 
as greater than the need to keep what he considered to be a territory not really worth having. To him, Europe was the end-all be-all, not the Americas. He also ended up having that attitude in the end about another French territory in the New World, the island of Haiti. Of course, one of his most important accomplishments is the Napoleonic Code, or the Code of Napoleon. Either way works. France had some major issues with their court system, especially after the end of the Committee on Public Safety and its issues with, you know, guillotining whoever they wanted. Laws for France had never really been uniform anyway, and Napoleon decided to make it that way. He made many of the ideas of the French Revolution into official law, stuff that was in the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and consolidated it so that the entirety of France would follow the same laws. It was a fantastic document, despite the fact that it left out women. Perhaps this is due to his experiences with his own wife, but he did not believe women capable of such civic duty. The code became even more important, though, when it was applied to his new territories. It did things like eliminate old aristocratic privilege and give rights to everyone. It standardized punishments for crimes, that's kind of a French thing, of course, with the guillotine, and made it possible for people to have freedoms they'd never had. No wonder Europeans would revolt in the future. They'd had a taste of certain liberties under the code of Napoleon when he controlled, or at least had them as a satellite nation. Ultimately, Napoleon became Emperor of France. He crowned himself in 1804. This is a giant mural-sized painting of the glorious event. He actually invited the Pope, who thought he was going to crown Napoleon in a ceremonious way that was like the old Holy Roman Empire back in the day, but he was mistaken. Napoleon took the crown from the Pope and placed it on his own head, and then crowned his Empress, Josephine, which you see happening in the painting. Once he became emperor, he had total control. He turned his thoughts outward to conquering the rest of Europe. Of course, his model for conquering Europe was Julius Caesar, his icon. Can you see the similarities between Napoleon's image and that of the Roman image? Napoleon saw himself as furthering the goals of a republic without really having one, just like Julius Caesar. Caesar saved the people from the corruption of a government and was named dictator for life. Napoleon saw himself as the people's savior and named consul for life, then of course snuck into the position of emperor as well. By the way, did you notice that consul was the title given to the heads of the state in Rome as well? Of course, not everyone saw Napoleon taking over Europe and France and everything as a positive thing. This is a British cartoon depicting the devil holding Napoleon as his baby. Uh, you can tell that the British weren't exactly positive about Napoleon taking over everything. This famous portrait shows him how he really wanted to be remembered, as a man on his imperial throne. Notice that the crown is like that of the Romans, but he also had the regalia of a true king or emperor of Europe. He's mixing the ideal with the reality, or so he thought. Now he thought it was time to truly create an empire worthy of having, but he had a few loose ends to tie up first. One of those, of course, was Haiti. Okay. Haiti had been in revolt since 1792. This Caribbean nation had a significant population imbalance. Slaves were a majority of the population, and even then there were free black and mulatto citizens, and then white citizens. Tensions arose between the classes as the French Revolution was underway from 1789 onward. The whites simply wanted independence from France, but the slaves wanted freedom, so it was a complicated war. The slaves revolted and were eventually led by Toussaint L'Ouverture, a former slave. Robespierre and his faction actually did abolish slavery, but once Napoleon had gotten power, he wanted to control the island because it produced 60% of the world's coffee and 40% of the world's sugar imported by France and Britain. Napoleon eventually saw this as a failed interest, but became more concerned with what was going on in Europe with his enemies there. Although Toussaint L'Ouverture did not live to see an independent Haiti, it did occur in 1804. It's a big event because it's the first Latin American revolution of many more to come. And the fact that Napoleon clearly abandoned his colonial interests because he had a bigger desire of taking over Europe.
Napoleon had a desire to control the seas. However, Great Britain would have something to say about that because they've had the most powerful navy for some time now. Britain and France had signed a truce a few years earlier, but neither country thought it would be a lasting peace. After all, Britain and France hated each other, and they've hated each other for centuries. Napoleon had full intentions on getting revenge on the British. As we recall, Napoleon had lost to Lord Admiral Horatio Nelson of the British fleet in Egypt, and he wanted to prove his worth against the celebrated British hero. Unfortunately, taking a look at this picture, Napoleon had a fleet of both Spanish and French ships, but they had no way of competing with the excellent maneuvering and tactics of the British. In the Battle of Trafalgar, the Lord. In the Battle of Trafalgar, the famous Lord Admiral Horatio Nelson was successful in defeating Napoleon's fleets. However, he was fatally wounded in the battle, and he died. That is why the famous Central Square in the heart of London is called Trafalgar Square, and Nelson's monument is the central monument within the square. After Horatio Nelson died, Napoleon was very sad. Not because Lord Nelson was dead, but because now he didn't have a chance to actually defeat him in battle. Nelson had the last word. Having lost control of the seas, Napoleon turned his attention to trying to weaken Great Britain through their economy. So he came up with this idea. It's called the Continental System. By Continental, he meant Continental Europe, which doesn't include the British Isles, as you can see. He made other countries on the continent of Europe agree to stop trading with the British. He controlled all the ports, he had the strongest army, and so he controlled the continent. The Portuguese, though, as you can see, were the only European nation to disagree with the treaty, which they could do since they were protected by the British in this instance. Really, the idea of a trade embargo never really worked. It hurt both the British as well as the rest of Europe minimally and of course the British had other people and places to trade with but it did demonstrate that Napoleon had a very very strong army on the mainland of Europe. The interesting thing about Napoleon is of course his battles but also the fast and furious way he took over most of the European continent. He's pretty much controlled Italy and France for some time now, so now he just needs the rest of Europe. Napoleon's troops moved faster than any other army at the time. His men lived off the land. They didn't need supply lines, which meant they could move a lot quicker than other armies. They marched into Austria, they marched to Austerlitz, and they defeated the coalition of Russians and the Austrians that awaited him. What is significant about this is not necessarily the fact that he conquered the Austrians, but the fact that he effectively destroyed the Holy Roman Empire. He officially dismantled it. It's about time. Now Francis I, the Emperor of Austria, was forced to go to the balcony of a famous church in Vienna and declare that the Holy Roman Empire was no more. So even though it was basically gone anyway, now Napoleon said enough is enough, Let's stop the pretenses. It's not holy. It's not Roman. It's not an empire. And it's done. Napoleon was not done with the former HRE, though. He went on to numerous victories in the smaller states of Germany that were ruled by those smaller princes and dukes who controlled those principalities. Because they're so small, their armies stood no chance against Napoleon, so many of them just said, I give up. This is called the shame of the princes. The shame of those who didn't even try to stand up for freedom, and they were overtaken by Napoleon. One territory was willing to fight, and that was Prussia. Frederick William III fought against Napoleon, but he lost. By this point, Napoleon had taken over two of the most powerful territories in Europe, and only had Spain and Russia left to take over. It was about this time that Napoleon divorced his wife, Josephine, who was actually the love of his life. You can see her divorce statement here. So why is he divorcing her? Well, the cheating might be an obvious reason, but at this point, he's an emperor and he has no heir to his throne. 
So in a very Henry VIII style move, he divorces his wife and marries an Austrian princess to cement that alliance. His new wife was Marie Louise. She gave him a son, and Napoleon was on top of the world. He named his new son as the ruler of Rome and gave him the title Napoleon II. Now, of course, Napoleon needed to control his newly acquired territories, so he placed his family and his next of kin in power throughout various places in Europe. Don't worry, you don't need to memorize this, you don't need to know it for a test, but just take a look at how many family members he places throughout Europe. Napoleon's next thought was to take over Spain. It's called the Peninsular Campaign because he planned to take both Spain and Portugal in this section of his rule. He had already secured an alliance with Russia, but he would leave that territory for takeover later. Spain, though, became known as the Spanish Ulcer because the Spaniards were much harder to subdue than Napoleon originally thought. His reason for invading Spain was to get Portugal to make them enforce the continental system from earlier, because you remember Portugal didn't do it. So you go through Spain, you get to Portugal, you conquer the entire peninsula, and then you control Western Europe. Remember that the continental system was designed to isolate Britain from trade, but the Portuguese, they were still trading with them. So Napoleon's forces invaded Spain. The Spanish, of course, were not okay with the invasion, and they resisted. The British, of course, sent out help, sent money, sent weapons to the Spaniards to help them fight against the French. What resulted was guerrilla-style warfare. It took five years, and Napoleon really had no gain. Sure, he sent more troops, but to no avail. He even deposed the Spanish king and put his brother on the throne, but that just made the people angrier. Thus, the Spanish campaign, better known as the Spanish Ulcer, was an utter disaster. Now, there was this guy, Goya, and he was a famous Spanish artist in the 1800s, and he painted this piece that you're looking at called The Third of May in 1808. You could see the person in white with his hands up. White always represents peace or innocence or surrender. So in this case, it depicts the brutality of the French soldiers, but the innocence of the Spaniards, who simply don't want to be taken over. Okay. So here is the map of Europe in 1810. Take a look at the dark green portion. This is what French owned. The light green territories were French satellite states. Basically, they were controlled by Napoleon or one of his relatives. And the purple are states that are allied with him. What do you notice about this? <laughs> There's a lot of green on this map. And a lot of purple, too. The man is on a roll, despite his setbacks in Spain. One of the most important things that he did, that he really didn't foresee, was to set up the future of the country of Germany. Remember that he dismantled the Holy Roman Empire. But checking out the map, you'll see that he made it into something called the Confederation of the Rhine. Take a look at the borders on the map here. He united a bunch of those previously independent mini-territories, little mini-kingdoms, little uh, principalities, where a prince was in charge, he combined them into one. Remember the shame of the princes from before? When all the princes just gave up rather than fight? This is the result of that. Of course, Austria and Prussia were considered allies, as you can see in purple, but it'll be Prussia that eventually unites the German-speaking peoples together into the country known as Germany. Here's another view of the map in all blue, just to give you an overall image of how much territory Napoleon basically controlled. That doesn't mean that he physically owned the countries or had necessarily conquered them outright. It does mean, however, that he considered it a part of his empire as a protectorate, or in some cases like Russia, an ally. Of course, one of the most famous blunders Napoleon made was during his Russian campaign in 1812. Most historians believe that this was the point that begins his ultimate downfall. 
While Spain wasn't exactly the best situation, it sure wasn't the disaster of Russia for the French. Remember that Napoleon's troops live off the land so they can move quickly. When he invaded Russia, he assumed that his average speed would continue. Thus, there was no need to bring heavy coats and warm attire for the winter, since it was the end of summer, and he could get through Russia in time. He invaded Russia with over 600,000 men, but he was surprised by the Russian strategy which bogged him down. The Russians used what is called the scorched earth policy. The nobles in the countryside retreated into Moscow to draw the French in. They burned their crops to the ground. They slaughtered their animals. By the time Napoleon was into Russia, there was nothing left to live off of. There was nothing to eat. His men were hungry. And because they didn't move quick enough, they were still in Russia when the winter hit. And it hit hard. He lost so many men to starvation and freezing, and therefore had an incomplete force when they finally attacked Moscow. It was a huge defeat and a huge victory for the Russians. This victory is actually the subject of a song. The 1812 Overture is usually played every 4th of July. It actually has nothing to do with the United States, but rather it was Tchaikovsky composing a song about the glorious victory over the French invaders. Now Napoleon had to retreat from Moscow in the winter. He only had 100,000 troops left when he retreated, and of those, only 40,000 survived. Remember, he started with 600,000, and now he's coming back with under 40,000. It's a terrible loss for Napoleon, and it's going to lead to his downfall. Napoleon was then defeated in October of 1813 in what's known as the Battle of Nations because so many participated in taking Napoleon down. It was near Leipzig, so it was in German territory. It was after the Battle of Leipzig that Napoleon Bonaparte was forced to abdicate or leave his throne. So the emperor has fallen. This is his official certificate of abdication. See, at first he wanted to abdicate in favor of his son, who would be called Napoleon II, but the other country said, mm, that's a negatory. So he abdicated, knowing that a Bourbon king, King Louis XVIII, would be placed on the throne in his place. So what do we do with Napoleon now? He can't be emperor anymore. We probably shouldn't let him stay in France. So, he'll be excited to the island of Elba. It's a small island off the coast of Italy. This is actually portrayed in the beginning of the movie The Count of Monte Cristo, if you've ever seen it. You can see on the map how great of a location it was for returning to power. His native home of Corsica was just the left, and Italy is just the right. And while he's exiled there, he's going to begin making plans for one of the most famous comebacks in history. His comeback is known as the Hundred Days. Napoleon escaped to France in March of 1815, which then prompted a new war with a new coalition. You can see here on the slide that France was just a little outnumbered, by pretty much every other country in Europe. Much like the War of Nations, there was going to be a great force fighting against Napoleon's France. He actually did quite well for a while, until the fateful Battle of Waterloo. Now, Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo has become famous, as have the names of the men who were responsible for his defeat. Waterloo was Napoleon's last stand. He fought against the Duke of Wellington from the British Army, effectively to a stalemate. The ground was muddy, the terrain was awful, and Napoleon was actually counting on an ultimate victory. However, the Prussian General Blucher showed up at the last minute, and as you can see, it's just too much to overcome. Historians often wonder why Napoleon ended up throwing in the towel instead of fighting to the end. Many of his men were ready to fight to the death, and they were ready to die for the glory of keeping Napoleon in power. But Napoleon was older, 
Perhaps he was wiser, and he knew that it would result in the deaths of hundreds of men. So he surrendered, and he abdicated his power for the last time. Napoleon's final place of exile was on the island of St. Helena. You can tell what the thoughts of the other powers were at this time. We will not let him come back for another 100 days. So, on an island between Africa and Brazil, Napoleon spent his final days. There's actually quite a bit of controversy on how he died, especially since the person who did the autopsy was more concerned with his fame than being accurate. Some say it was stomach cancer. Others said that he had high levels of arsenic in his hair, so that indicates he was poisoned. Some say the wallpapers on his wall in St. Helena were soaked in arsenic, so that's how he was poisoned. Either way, the great man died far away from his family, far away from his friends, and far away from France. Napoleon's body is interred in France's Le Invalide, an interesting group of building in France that's part military hospital, part museum, uh, part crypt. Famous war heroes are buried there, and this is a picture of Napoleon's tomb. You can see how big it is when you compare it to the girl sitting on the left side. A lot of famous people have visited Napoleon's resting site. But the guy who might top them all is Adolf Hitler. You see, just like Napoleon had a giant man crush on Julius Caesar, Adolf Hitler had a giant man crush on Napoleon. Because all three of these guys just wanted to conquer Europe. And so here, Adolf Hitler is seen visiting his idol, the man who almost conquered Europe. Now France was back in the hands of a bourbon king. Here's a picture of Lee. Here's a picture of King Louis XVIII. There's no way this man could have been popular, even though he tried his best. He kept the Napoleonic Code of Laws, and he did a few extra good things for the purple, for the people, but he was a bourbon. He was a member of the family that they had overthrown in 1789. Part of the reason why Napoleon was accepted is because the people viewed him as one of them. He wasn't a noble, he wasn't a member of the royal bourbon family, and that's why the people were so prejudiced against this new Louis. Once Napoleon was gone, the rest of Europe starts to reflect, and they find out how shocked they are on how easy it was for Napoleon to pretty much conquer Europe. He conquered Italy, Austria, and Prussia. He almost conquered Spain and Russia, and it scared them. In order to figure out how to stop this from ever happening again, the countries of the Big Four sent representatives to a, con to a conference in Vienna. It's now called the Congress of Vienna. It was a meeting of the minds. It was a meeting of the most powerful countries in the world, and it was presided over by Clemens von Metternich the sort of prime minister of Austria. Our big four, Britain, Prussia, Russia, and Austria, were trying to decide on how to settle the remaining issues that the French Revolution brought to Europe. At this Congress of Vienna, they decided three main points were essential. First, we have to preserve the balance of power. We're not going to have another Napoleon take over everyone. They wanted European countries to respect each other and basically be about equal in power with one another. Next, they don't want more crazy revolutions. They don't want the people taking power. They don't want the mob taking over. They don't want people who are not legitimately hereditary monarchs. That means that we need the true families back in power, the traditional ones. Now, we know Britain didn't feel as strongly as the others about the royalty situation, but they went along for stability's sake. Finally, they wanted France to pay damages for all of the years of war from 1791 